والله يدعو الى دار السلام ويهدي من يشاء الى صراط مستقيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته peace and allah's mercy be upon you uh, alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah all praise belongs to allah alone and we pray for Allah's peace and blessings upon the Prophet Muhammad. This is universal Qur'an. We study the Qur'an, Allah's scripture, and its interpretation and explanation in the science of tafsir. The Qur'an was revealed more than 1400 years ago in the land of Mecca, in what is now Saudi Arabia. It seems like a long time ago to most humans, a different culture, a different uh, time and place, but it's a universal book. It is meant as guidance for all of humanity. By going back and examining the context in which these verses were revealed and how the early generations understood them in the original language, uh, hopefully we can be enlightened as to how to apply it to our own time. And indeed, it is a book that is meant to be applied in every aspect of our lives. To help us out, uh, we have Brother Fairuz. Fairuz is from Singapore. He's an expert reciter of the Holy Quran, and he will be reciting the verses for us in the original Arabic language as they were revealed to the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him. And then to help us, uh, especially English speakers, uh, we have Brother Bilal, and Bilal is from Canada, and he will be uh, reading for us the English interpretation of the meanings of these verses. We're reading from the 30th section, or juz of the Qur'an, the final section of the Holy Qur'an. Today we're going to be reading uh, chapter 90, Al-Balad. I'm going to ask Fayruz to please read the first four verses of that. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا أقسم بهذا البلد وأنت حل بهذا البلد ووالد وما ولد لقد خلقنا الإنسان في كبد Thank you. Yeah. I seek refuge with Allah from Shaitan the outcast in the name of Allah the most gracious the most merciful I swear by this city and you are free in this city and by the begetter and what he begot verily we have created man in toil thank you this surah al-balad is talking about the city of Mecca the sacred city of Islam uh this surah was revealed in the early stage in Mecca. And the Prophet Muhammad and the small Muslim community were a persecuted minority in the holy city of Mecca. Mecca lies in an arid valley in Arabia, 50 miles inland from the Red Sea. Mecca was established uh, by the Prophet Abraham. And together Abraham and his son Ismail built the holy house of Allah in Mecca, the Kaaba and dedicated it to the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. But over the generations, the descendants of Abraham and the nearby Arab tribes took up the worship of idols and set up more than 360 different idols around the Kaaba. In fact, if you can imagine that one day the Kaaba was surrounded by all of those idols. And the Prophet Muhammad's duty was to call his people back to the original religion of monotheism of Tawheed. Mecca is a sacred city which uh, pilgrims have been uh, coming to since the dawn of time. At the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they already had been going for gen generations and generations, centuries to the holy city of Mecca. Only after a great difficult journey could they get there. Not like today when we have modern transportation to take us there, but people would spend their whole lives on a journey, literally, to Mecca and they would undergo a great deal of sacrifice. And so Allah is calling into witness this sacred city, which he put there in an arid desert, 
where there was no water, there was no vegetation. And by a miracle, uh, when Hajar, the mother of Ismail, was searching for water, Allah brought water up from the ground, which is the sacred well of Zemzem. If not for that well, she would not have survived, nor would Ismail. And of people would not have come there and settled there. But all these millions of people have been coming there for all these millennia. And people have settled there, and it's a, a large city, for only the reason that Allah took care of Hajar and Ismail, brought the water, and then later on, when Ismail was an adult, they built the sacred house, which is the place of pilgrimage that people have been coming to for all of these many, many, many centuries. And so the entire city of Mecca is a miracle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that it shouldn't be there. There shouldn't be a place in that terribly dry, hot desert that all these millions of people dream of coming to who never even make it, let alone the millions who actually do make it. Uh, and so the historical beautiful city of Mecca with the sacred house of Allah in the center itself is the greatest sign, physical sign in this earth of Allah's caring for mankind. And so Every day during their daily prayers, Muslims from throughout the world face toward Mecca, and it's the hub of our faith. And all the communities throughout the world are like the spokes of a wheel. They're all facing toward this house in recognition of Allah's mercy and blessing to Abraham, Hajar, and Ismail, and to the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, who, by a miracle of Allah, was able to take that city uh, in a blood-free um, conquest and remove all those idols, all those terrible uh, uh, statues that people had uh, dedicated themselves to worship and enslaved themselves to. So Allah is calling to witness this sacred city of Mecca. And he says, the Prophet, that you are hillun fi hadabal, hillun or halal, that you are free, free from sin in this city. You are free and this city is permitted to you. It's a sacred place where there was no killing allowed, nobody was allowed to fight, and nobody is till this day. But Allah made it uh, halal or permitted for one day in all of history for the Prophet Muhammad to go there to take the city and to purify it from the uh, evil of idolatry. But he granted security to every person in Mecca who would stay within the house of Abu Sufyan or would stay within their own houses that they would not be harmed. Because the Prophet ﷺ did not want to shed the blood of people in the sacred a sanctuary, and he calls into witness the fact that uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala created us through uh, reproduction. That the human beings and all creatures reproduce themselves. That Allah gave us uh, ancestors and fathers from the time of Adam, and each of us have taken the characteristics of our ancestors for good and for evil. But we are held responsible for our own individual sin, not like people believe that. As it's said in the Bible, as people have uh, attributed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that uh, uh, the son takes on the sin of his father and his grandfather all the way back to Adam, so that each human being is responsible for the sin of Adam and we're all guilty of sin from the time we're born. But in Islam, each individual is uh, sin free, each individual is born innocent, and only are we responsible for decisions we make as adults when we can have an intelligence and we have awakened our moral conscience so that we can uh, our, our, our moral conscience so we can uh, distinguish good from evil then we're responsible for our own sins at, at uh, what age does uh, a person start to sin at well a person is held responsible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and before the community when they reach puberty when they reach physical maturity on condition that they're mental uh, capacity is normal. And then they're held to be fully responsible. But of course, each individual is responsible up to what they can understand. Sometimes people reach maturity and yet they are still not fully able to understand things uh, until uh, a few years later. But when a, a, a girl or a, a boy reach puberty, then they're considered to be adults. They have to pray, they have to fast, they have to do everything they're responsible before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That doesn't mean that their parents aren't responsible, but actually in Islam, parents are responsible for their children for their entire lives, mm -hmm. no matter how old they are. And children are responsible for their parents. And all of us are, are also mutually responsible for each other. But Allah goes on in the fourth verse that He has created the human being in toil. That is that we have been created for trials and tests. We undergo difficulty and disease and death and all kinds of things. Nothing comes easy for us in this world. That is the human creation. 
our father Adam was created in Jannah. But because of the sin of Adam and Hawa, uh, they came down to this earth, and we are born in this earth. It's a trial and test to see. How, yes. Uh -huh. uh, Hawa is uh, Eve. Eve. Yeah, okay. Eve. Adam and Eve. Uh, uh, this world is a test for them, uh, for us, and it's a trial, uh, and it's difficult. We don't achieve anything. We're not born as some animals are born standing up. They immediately stand up on two feet and go out and feed themselves. But human beings are weak. We need people to help us and to care for us. By Allah's grace, we have families that nurture us. We go into adulthood, but we learn things gradually by degrees, and yet we claim sometimes divinity. Some human beings claim to be gods, or that some other human beings are God, or God is incarnate in them. But God doesn't change. God doesn't need to develop or evolve. That is the weakness of the human being, that we evolve and develop and change from uh, every stage. But Allah SWT doesn't pass from one stage to another. But He's eternal, uh, outside of the changes that are necessary in this world. The human being needs things. We're, from the time we're born, we're looking for nourishment. Where is the milk going to come from? The tiny infant is already looking for that, looking for help wherever we can get it. So we have needs. We feel hunger. Then we have ignorance. We feel we have to learn things. So even the tiny infant starts listening uh, to the words of his parents and the people around him trying to learn, trying to develop. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't need to anything. He, he doesn't lack anything. He's perfect and complete in himself. Let's read the next uh, three verses, please, five through seven. أيحسب أن لن يقدر عليه أحد يقول أهلكت مالا لبدا أيحسب أن لم يره أحد thinks he that none can overcome him he says boastfully I have wasted wealth in abundance thinks he that none sees him so this, uh, these verses were revealed in Mecca, and the early Muslims were very terribly persecuted. People were killed, driven out of their homes. And Allah is saying to them, do you think that nobody can overcome you? You who are born, born so weak, and you depend on everything. And this city that you're living in was all brought there by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If it weren't for that water, if it weren't for the pilgrimage, people coming from all over the world, you would have no ability to live. But because of their weak intellect, they imagine that nobody can overcome them on this earth or in heaven. That there's no human who can conquer them, nor Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they think that we can kill the weak, the weak followers of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We can persecute them, and there will be no consequences to pay. Uh, uh, they, they boast. They boast. Oh, I've wa wasted wealth in abundance. I've wasted so much money. As if con consumption, and that's even a, a disease of our time. The consumption shows how powerful you are. But it's actually the opposite. Consumption shows how weak you are, how dependent you are on other things, that you require so much stuff in order to survive or, or, or in order to be happy. You can't even be happy just with the minimum or just surviving or, or just having a happy home life and being able to support yourself and your children. You have to have more and more and more, consume more and more and more. That's not a sign of your strength. That's a sign of your weakness. And it's a sign of the weakness of any society that it boasts of how huge its consumption is. So if you look at our society, for example, in the West, we consume the vast majority of our resources of the world, and we leave the rest of the world without very much of resources. That's because we believe that only that nobody is seeing us, nobody's taking account. It says in verse 7, does he think that no one sees him? And of course, Allah SWT is aware of all. The one who provided you with all of that, who provided this holy city of Mecca for these people in Arabia, the one who provided you with your living, of course, is going to hold you to account for that someday. So we're going to go on, um, uh, take our break, and then we'll come back. We'll read the rest of this surah, inshallah. Jazakum Allahu khairan. <laughs>
Welcome back to Universal Quran. Before the break, we are reading from chapter 90 of the Holy Quran, Surah Al Balad. I'm going to ask our brother Fayruz to read verses 8 through 10, please. Alam Najalahu Ainain Walisana Washafatain Wahadaina Hun Najidain. Have we not made for him a pair of eyes, and a tongue, and a pair of lips, and shown him the two ways? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the previous verses uh, pointed out the holy city of Mecca and this, as one of the signs, which he's calling signs of his power and wisdom, and how he created the human being and our lives are full of struggle, and we need to fulfill all of our, our uh, basic necessities through struggle in this world. Nothing is easy, easy in this world. Uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, does, it, does he think that no one sees him? Uh, did not Allah create for us a pair of eyes? When we we're in the womb, he developed and created uh, in us what we need in this world, our mind, our eyes, our tongue and lips to see, to express our, ourselves, to express our desires. Uh, and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, look at all the senses that the human being has. Where did that come from? Did uh, eyes and ears and, 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 and tongues and lips just somehow create themselves and appear? Did they come from a source that itself was blind and deaf and dumb? No, of course not. The source of the senses that human beings had, of course, came from a source which is all-powerful and all-knowing. So is it hard to imagine that Allah, who created human eyes, himself doesn't see everything here in, th in existence. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who gave us the ability to communicate, that he doesn't communicate also with us and tell us what we need to do, how we need to use our eyes, how we need to use our lips and tongue and all the senses and all the limbs that he gave us. Of course not. It's part of the wisdom of this world. If we lived in a world had no source in a divine, perfect creator, then the world would be meaningless, valueless, and our lives would be just like animal lives. We would kill, we would do whatever we wanted, struggle, take whatever we wanted, and we would live and die, and that would be the end of it. it there would be nobody guilty, nobody innocent, nobody would be good, nobody would be evil, because there would be nobody to judge us. And what makes things good and evil is that you have consequences and responsibility uh, when you do things. And so it, it, it wouldn't make sense that uh, Allah subhanahu wa isn't watching us and taking account of us. And that's why in the 10th verse, uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed us the two ways, the two pathways. And the two is good and evil? The, exactly, good and evil. It's like dra traveling in the wilderness, traveling in the mountains, and there are two paths, and you have to, you get to where the path you're on divides, and you have to make a choice. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides us to the choice depending on whether, whether we want to obey Him or not. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will, there are two types. Uh, the shari'i will, that means what is revealed to us in the scripture and in the guidance of the prophets. That Allah tells us what He wants us for do and, we, and what He wants us to do and then we do it. And then what is called kauni will, that Allah makes everything in this world and created it as it, it is and He knows what's going to happen in the future. And, of course, he already knows what choices we're going to make even before we make them. But we can't say, oh, Allah didn't show me the right way and I made a mistake. No, he showed us. We have to look into the Qur'an, into the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad, so that, وسلم, so we can make decisions about which way to take. Let's read the next verses, um, 11 through 16, inshallah. <laughs> وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا الْعَقَبَةِ فَكُّ رَقَبَةِ أَوْ إِطْعَامٌ فِي يَوْمٍ ذِي مَسْغَبَةِ يَتِيمًا ذَا مَقْرَبَةِ أَوْ مِسْكِينًا ذَا مَتْرَبَةِ But he has made no effort to pass on the path that is steep. And what will make you know the path that is steep? It is freeing a slave or giving food in a day of famine to an orphan near of kin 
or to a poor man afflicted with misery. As we saw in the previous video, the city of Mecca is surrounded by uh, rough mountains, mountains that are full of boulders, uh, solid granite. Uh, of course, there are, there, are, there are cactus and thorns, and they're surrounded by desert areas. It's a difficult area to travel in, and the people of Mecca knew very well how hard it was to travel in the wilderness. And so Allah is giving them examples from the environment around them. He said they have not made an effort to take the steep path uh, through the mountain passes where you have to get through a mountain and you go over a path and it's very steep and hard. And so if you want to get to the other side successfully, you're going to have to make a, a struggle going over that mountain. If you try to go around the long mountains, you're going to get lost somewhere in the desert. Long before you get to the other side, it's so far around that, of course, it would be foolish not to take that steep path over. But it's not easy. And so Allah is comparing the righteous action, al-bir in, in, in the Quranic terminology, the righteous action, He's comparing it to taking a rough, steep trail in the mountains, that it's not easy. You have to make a hard choice sometimes to do things which are not easy for the human being. And so, what is it? How will, how will you know? What is this steep path? Uh, because uh, Allah is all-merciful and wise. So if Allah wants you to do something difficult, then the reward must be very great. Because Allah would not command you to do something that was very difficult for no reason. But He would be offering you something that was more than justification for that steep trip over the mountains. And so he gave examples. Freeing a slave or a captive, somebody who's in captivity, an innocent person in bondage, uh, oppression, a person who is living in difficult circumstances, refugees who are uh, you know, fleeing their countries, and uh, people who are suffering great damage and loss and illness, people who need your help. You have to be thankful for Allah's provision to you by helping those people, freeing them from the difficulties in which they're in. Uh, and then he mentions, of course, the, the, the orphan, the orphan, on, uh, uh, I mean, the, 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 uh, the uh, uh, person who is uh, uh, starving in famine in, in Mecca and in those cities. Famine is very close. They w it wasn't an agricultural area. Their food came from far away. Everything they needed came from far away. So it's close to you, just like you don't know that tomorrow you wouldn't be a person in need or in captivity or a refugee. You wouldn't know if tomorrow... Uh, there's not a famine or depression, and you would suffer. So if you have wealth today, you give a portion to others in this life for the sake of Allah, and Allah will give you in the hereafter. Plus, in the future, you may be in need, and those same people may be able to help you. And that's how it comes in this life, that you help others and others help you. Or an orphan who is related to you, you need to help people in your own family, as well as a poor person who's not related to you, who's, as it says here, clinging to the dust, sitting on the ground, begging, sitting in the dust uh, out of misery and poverty. And so you help those people out of the risk or bounty which has been granted to you by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you will find treasures waiting for you in the akhirah that are far eclipse that, because what you receive in the akhirah is inf infinite, while those are the money that you actually spend is limited. What exactly is, what did you say, akhirah? Al-Akhirah is the hereafter, the next world, mm -hmm. the world in heaven. Uh, verses 17 through 18. الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالصَّبْرِ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالْمَرْحَمَةِ أُولَٰئِكَ أَصْحَابُ الْمَيْمَنَةِ Then he came, one of those who believed. And recommend. Uh, sorry, then he became one of those who believed, and recommended one another to patience, and recommended one another to compassion. They are those on the right hand. Thank you. Those people who lived in the holy city of Mecca, like I said, they were always they're they're living in a desert area, they were living in a place where life was difficult, and yet they were successful and they had wealth. And everybody came to them and they were able to trade with people from all over the world coming to the pilgrimage in Mecca by cooperating. By if, if they didn't cooperate and help each other, then they wouldn't have been able to survive. And that's a lesson for all of us, that we have to cooperate. And so Allah SWT is saying that they had a mutuality. They advised one another from wasiya, which is to advise in a gentle way. They advise each other in that which is the truth, the truth, that which is reality 
the reality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have to uh, recommend, as it said in this translation, to one another, uh, to be compassionate for one another, marhama, to be full of compassion and mercy for our brothers and our sisters, to be steadfast. And all of that is a great mercy from Allah, that we don't exist as individuals. Could you imagine if you were an individual all alone living in the desert? What would you do? How would you survive? What kind of struggle every day looking for food? There are people, for example, in, in parts of Africa where a woman has to get up in the morning and walk for miles and miles and miles to get water and doesn't get back till night with the day's water that the family will drink. Uh, and people suffer like that in different parts of the world. But if we cooperate with each other, we have what is called a civilization. And the ummah is a brotherhood where everybody each plays a role. And so somebody provides you with your drink. Somebody provides you with your food. Somebody provides you with your clothing. You don't have to go out and get all those things for yourself, which would be a great difficulty if you had to make your, your own food, make your own clothing, make your own shelter, and you depended alone upon yourself. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made us to work and patiently, patiently with each other and cooperate. And when we harm one another and do not cooperate, we're actually harming ourselves because we're all equally dependent on on the society as a whole. And so we have to do so with a purity which is dedicated to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in thanksgiving for Allah, far away from eye service, doing things so that people will see us. But we do it because we're thankful that Allah has given all this to us as His bounty. So if we, if we are, are, are truly thankful, then we don't do it, uh, I don't help you so that you will be so happy and you will thank me and everybody will praise me oh how generous he is and what, how kind he is to others but do so for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even do it secretly where nobody knows that you're giving charity uh, your, your left hand doesn't know what your right hand is doing when it's giving in charity and that way you conceal it from people but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will increase your re reward because it's done for his sake not for the sake of any human being and those people who do that they're the people of the right hand or the right side, on the day of judgment, they will have the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The left side are those people who are in Allah's punishment, as we'll see in the last verses of the Quran, if you can read that for me. But those who disbelieved in our signs, they are those on the left hand the fire will be shut over them. So on the Day of Judgment, Allah divides between those people of the right and those people of the left. Those people of the right are those people who have guided themselves by Allah's message in this Holy Quran in their lives. The people of the left are those people who have ignored Allah's commandments, knowingly uh, have been selfish, knowingly have rejected the wisdom of the ages which has been revealed to the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they're the ones on the left side, as it says, the, court, the fire will be shut over them, as if they're closed in, they have no escape. You know, locked in, can you imagine, you know, like being locked in a box, but what if the box were fire? Uh, much worse than, than, uh, than anything you can imagine. Uh, even in the grave, the unbelievers uh, see their place in hellfire. You can imagine being shut into a coffin, buried under the ground, how that is. But then what if you see uh, in full 3D your, your place in hellfire? Uh, it, it's a terrifying idea of being shut into hellfire. So we have to realize that everything we do as adults in this world is showing which way we're going. As Allah said, He shows us the two paths. He gives us a choice between those two paths. That's the Sharia way. That Allah has given us His will and we choose which one we do by our intention. The koni, or by Allah's qadr, is that once we have the right intention, we're not always able to fulfill. So we have the intention for salat, but Allah doesn't will. We could die intending. So everything is by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will, and in the end, we have to choose the right choice based on the Quran and the Sunnah. That's all we have for today. Uh, please join us next time for a universal Quran. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi. وترى الجبال تحسبها جامدة وهي تمر مر السحاب صنع الله الذي 
أتقن كل شيء إنه خبير بما تفعلون مثل الذين ينفقون أموالهم في سبيل الله كمثل حبة أنبتت سبع سنابل وكل في فلك يسبحون 